welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. I didn't get to do what I was supposed to do, but it will happen afterwards, I hope. <laughs> so. so welcome. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions, suggestions, comments, sharings, whatever. Um, just to say thank you, Evie, for the um, scalp uh, handout you forwarded to me on email. Uh huh. Yes. Yes. Sorry, I forgot to uh, <clears throat> to say thanks for that. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> yeah, that was from Camille, actually. <laughs> so. If she joins, I'll say thank you to her as well. <laughs> yes, I will. Thank you. Anything else? Um, I'm. I have just a question, maybe about what you might use to treat somebody with um, a very like um, viral infection with a very high temperature. Okay, you have a few options. Do you know what it's a viral infection, and what part is it affecting mostly? Um, probably head. Um, just like a really high temperature and some headache with it, just like a really um, bad flu or, you know, with, with high, with high you know, very, person is very hot, okay. high temperature. Okay. So generally, okay, it's interesting because I was thinking about something similar, you know, just a little bit ago. Um, so in terms of the actual answer of what would I use, it would be basically immune points. Okay, and so there is a so-called immune protocol, which consists besides of the immune points also of kidney seven, of sorry, kidney six, and do 14. Okay. Um, and you can actually moxa in spite of the fever. I would not be afraid to moxa. Um, the thing is, and then on the back, Ihicon. Um, bladder 58, uh, bladder 60, and bladder 40, but lateral bladder 40, um, lateral to bladder 40, rather, which I actually take even above. So I actually take it more like bladder 38, and I needle it inwards uh, towards the middle of the popliteal fossa. But um, most people will take it around uh, bladder 39 and just needle it straight in. Um, Ihicon is a combination that's used, number one, for head injuries number two for things that start with fevers okay so those are the two things um however i will say this i think that you know like sometimes people talk about oh you know i went to some chinese guy and he did this amazing you know like he they i don't know they took a lancet and bled like half a pint of blood from them or you know th those kinds of stories man i felt so much better and everything is fabulous I think this is where some of the releasing pressure kind of strategies work really well for, for something like someone has a huge amount of pus, a huge amount of fever, a huge, you know, those things actually, things like cupping, bleeding, things of that nature work, can work really well because they release pressure like really fast. And, you know, so, and whereas, this style, the style that I use for the most part, because I don't really see a lot of people come with like infectious diseases or, you know, I see people come with the effects of the afterwards of this stuff. I'm geared much more to a chronic um, situation. Um, hi, Austin. <laughs> hi, sorry, my kid wanted to come inside. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> Kitty, oh. Um, anyway, so... I don't, you know, so I don't, I would say like a lot of the TCM strategies for reducing fevers might actually be a lot better because, you know, not because I have personal experience that, that's that evolved around it, but because these are people who like, this is what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, things like I would definitely add gallbladder 20 because it manifests in the head. Um, and well, yeah, it's the wind and blah, 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 blah. So I would add things from the TCM protocol it, when I have someone who has something like a high fever. It's when it's three weeks later or three years later that this style becomes the, um, so much more effective, in my opinion, than, than the, the, the so-called TCM stuff. And I, not, not to put that down anybody, but you know what I'm saying. 
Um, so I think this is a thing for the acute, high pressure type situations where you want to release something immediately. Um, and I'm not talking about the knee pain or the back pain. That this style is good at. But for the things like lots of pus, lots of fever, you know, something of that nature, generally where the medical history may not play a huge role. This, this is not the forte of the style. This is the forte of the people who do like the really rough stuff. You know, they, they take big lancets and, you know, and suck the hell out of you and stuff of that nature. So I would say you may want to go that route. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, and that's just my opinion. <laughs> and what would you be thinking of with Moxa? With Moxa, I think direct Moxa is okay for fever. I know that the TCM people are just rolling in whatever graves or <laughs> couches or <laughs> whatever they have, whatever they're sitting on, they're going, they can't believe he said Moxa when they have fever. Yes, you can Moxa, direct Moxa. It's the, you know, Ocu is different than Kyotoshin. You know, it's not warming. I mean, it can be warming, but, you know, so Moxa on kidney six, Moxa on immune point, Moxa on um, do 14 is very useful. And yes, I would also cup the upper back to see if you can get the upper back to push, pull out the, that, that fever. But I would still Moxa do 14, I, I would do direct Moxa on do 14 in spite of the fever. Um, because it stimulates the point, it stimulates the immune response. So it's not the same as, you know, when you have a moxa stick and it's, it's hot and you're quote unquote adding heat to the heat, you know, and then the, of course the people will argue that you can fight fire with fire. Um, but for that argument, then a point like kidney two, for example, is supposed to be a good thing. You can moxa kidney two for fevers. Um, again, I don't have that experience. This is just what I've heard. Um, I've never done it um, just because it's, just not in my repertoire. Um, but you can't fight fevers with moxa. You know, you just wouldn't do moxa. You would not be doing um, a stick moxa on do 20 with someone on fever, but you might be doing moxa on their feet. You know, even in the, in the traditional Chinese modality, you can use heat, fire, fire to fight fire sort of thing. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Anyone else? Anything else? <laughs> yes, go go for it. So I have three patients right now. Um, they all have this spastic kind of cough for different reasons. Mm -hmm. And I share one of you with you on my email. One of them is my mom. Oh, yes, I remember. Yeah. yeah, and then the second case I also share, she has this weird nausea and comes with cough in the mornings. Okay. So in the morning she coughs, and especially when she brushes her teeth, the nausea starts. And throughout the day it gets worse. I'm sorry, it gets better, but sometimes it might get worse with food. Mm -hmm. So I was doing very well. She was getting better. I gave her herbs, and then you know she emails me back. It's like four days later the nausea came back. This was happening the last three weeks, and I was doing you know di releasing different. Actually, what you said made a lot of sense and made me a little bit more confused and insecure about my, my practice. Oh. Because, you know, the releasing the abdomen doesn't mean that you're actually touching the root in a way. <laughs> so it's like, okay, I release everything. She feels better on the table and she gets better a couple of days and then it's back. So I'm missing something. And then another patient. So they all had this weird cough. And then I know, you know, with each patient, I need to try probably something else. But, you know, I'm giving little bits of information and I'm curious what you think about, about it. So, and um, this patient just emailed me last night saying that, you know, I start trying CBD oil and it really seemed to help. So I'm trying all these different, you know, jingfang herbs and like studying Kiko and doing whatever I, you know, I did cupping on her back, I did maxa on immune points and she's like I'm feeling much better with CBD I'm like damn you know 
<laughs> so you should become a CBD uh, seller instead of an acupuncturist. Yeah, I, I literally get magazines, you know, do you want to sell this product? I'm like, no. <laughs> no, I mean, look, so, well, there's a few commentaries that are unrelated to the cough, or maybe these are coughings of my mind. Uh, I have nothing to do with reality. I think the thing is CBD is the popular thing and it's supposed to be the cure for everything. So whether it's a CBD or it's placebo, part of being in the profession of helping people is, is to give them what they want. And make it, I know, I know it's possible that the CBD is really helping this person. And it's also possible that just because it's CBD um, and it's, you know, it's like, oh, famous person said CBD, you know, like Madonna is doing CBD for her cough. I must be getting better also for it. I don't know. I don't know enough about, but, but you see it, it, it's become this huge phenomenon. So it's bound to affect how people see it. And since none of us know what the mechanisms exactly are, um, there was another cough of my mind is, um, there was a posting on Facebook a little a few days ago um, by someone asking what's the mechanism of CBD from a Chinese perspective. And someone said, well, since it releases pain, it must be moving qi. You know, the tang tzu tang sort of, when, where there's stagnation, there's pain. When there's no stagnation, there's no pain. Well, it's very, it's interesting to see how, how we all think about these things because Pain is really one way to get pain is stagnation of chi, by the way. And most um, pain relieving herbs are actually moving, moving blood, as a matter of fact. So, you know, so, so th these correlations are not so, so clear or exact. Now, dampness can create pain and you can say, I mean, anything can create pain. And then you can say, oh, the pain is lack of, is, is chi not moving? There's also chi deficient or blood deficient pains for example. So it's just interesting how we latch on to and the, the, what we believe, I think that the, the idea behind CBD is that it binds to receptors, you know, that, that there are cannabinoid receptors in the body, blah, blah, blah. So it, it actually works on the shen. It, it quote unquote, calm, because we don't, we don't say there's chi stagnation in the shen. We say the shen is, uh, I don't know, disturbed, something like that. The, the shen is not working smoothly. So we smooth the shen and therefore the, you know, the patient will feel less pain or we, um, we say, you know, like with meditation, for example, if you open the mind more, the mind is less constantly, you know, gnawing at the pain, you know, rehearsing the pain again and again. So, but with regards to cup, now I do think that probably CBD does have an effect on the lungs. You know, because I think it's not just because people smoke marijuana usually, but um, because they can eat it also, but because it does seem like it has an effect on the lungs. So they, they, this person may not be imagining everything. So now two of these patients, it seems like their cough is related to food, though. The third one, I'm not sure. The third one might be the CBD person. I don't know if that's... Uh, the no, that's yeah. different. Yeah, but... Um, so cough that's related to food often has something to do with the esophagus and the esophagus is producing some sort of spasm that then affects the lungs possibly. So that's the way I would look at it. Um, generally with cough, the thing that I'm looking at first and foremost is lung five, possibly lung eight. I might be uh, looking at spleen four, which is considered an anti-inflammatory point for the lung. It's also considered, you know, spleen four is, is the opening for the chung, and the chung has to do with surging up. So, quote unquote, counterflow of qi can be related to the chung. I would also st check stomach 30 because the, uh, the zong qi, the pectoral qi, is related to stomach 30. Okay, that's why stomach 30 is so, so important, besides the fact that it is the, supposedly the first point on the chung, in, in, on the torso. Um, then on the back, a protocol that I find quite helpful is um, do 14, and these are Watos for the most part, okay? So do 14 Watto, and either T3 Watto or UB13, T7 or UB17, and UB20 or T1112. Okay, that's a protocol that came from Kauai, and that seems to be quite effective, and that definitely I would add Moxa to it. 
Um, and you can add any kind of moxa to that. In other words, you can actually, because Kawai used Kyotoshin. He never used a needle without Kyotoshin. You know, scalp needle, uh, ear needle, any needle. There was no such thing. Needle did not exist without a huge glob of moxa on top of it. You know, there's no, there's no needle unless there's moxa. Okay, there was no moxa without needle either, but they, the two just totally came together. Um, so warming up these points, you know, um, it again it creates a histamine reaction. It creates a huge reaction, and especially in the upper in the upper uh, thoracics, so that can activate the lungs and expel stuff. Um, and because it's related to food, I would look at um, so. I think I, on the email, I mentioned to you that I have a patient that has something very similar. It sounded very similar to what your mother has that, you know, they eat and then they, they have this weird coughing thing. And she has this weird, high, super highly extended feet. Like it's like she's pointing a feet. She has incredibly high arches, you know. And so I do, uh, stomach 40 is the point that's very, you know, very useful in her. Um, but these coughs that relate to, to food are not so easy to control because there, I think there's also an allergic reaction in there. So with allergies, what you're looking at is immune points and you're looking possibly to needle around the navel. And I think I suggest to you also left of um, T11, T12, or even up down to, to L2, that there may be slightly outside the Watto line, there may be some uh, weird... Um, nodule or, or something the, that's a cisterna chile. This is where the fats, the lipids, are being stored on the way to the liver. And if they're not, uh, if they're not digested well, they can, they can be one of the cause for uh, allergies. So uh, that's kind of like the general uh, outline that I would have, like for you know, for coughing and or coughing related to um, digestion. And then the rest, I would go with you know, depending on the medical history. And I wouldn't be so afraid of, you know, yeah, so you poke the abdomen and yes, you think you're treating the root and maybe you're not, and you'll find out that you're not. It's okay to find out that I went all wrong. <laughs> it's, part of, it's, it's part of the deal. And not to name names, but, um, you know, look at the person that at least you used to study with. Um, you know, I mean, he plays around like hell by personality. <laughs> it's just his nature. You know, and he's extremely successful with with all this playing. You know, you don't always have to know. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you, you can't. There's just no way you can. You just have to do what you can. You play with with what you, with the information that you have, and you went wrong. You went wrong. I mean, first of all, it doesn't mean you went wrong. You know, it's not as personal as we tend to like to assume that it is which is difficult because when the patient gets better, we try and take it personally because it's good for us. <laughs> and then when they tell us it's a CBD, we also take it personally. It's like, it's, nothing is personal. As long as, the, you know, how should I say? The only thing that's personal is that they paid you. They paid you. That's the only personal thing that happened. <laughs> the rest is, I did my job. You, you laid on the table. And, you know, I, I, I can like you. It can be, there can be a nice personal interaction, but it's not my... I can't take the responsibility. I have to allow myself to play. Because without it, I'm not going, I'll never go anywhere. Because only X percentage of people fit into protocols. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, you have to play. And then, so if you have a huge clinic, if you're seeing 30, 40 people a day, it really doesn't matter. Because X percentage get better, X percentage don't get better. The percentage that gets better is high enough. Out of 40 people, enough people are going to say, hey, she's great, and they're happy, and then you can ignore. I and mean, Miriam Lee did that all the time. Somebody didn't come back. She would say, oh, they're cured. I'm like, how do you know? Why do you think they're cured? <laughs> he didn't come back. He must be cured. <laughs> like, no, maybe your needles were horrible. Maybe whatever. He didn't like whatever it is that he didn't like. You can't just, you, well, you can do whatever you want, but, you know, because her volume was so big, it didn't matter. She wasn't taking any of it personally. Mm -hmm. So it's worth kind of like uh, letting go of this idea. If I do the abdomen, something will happen, you know, like then I'm, I'm committing. Okay. Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
And uh, Avi, just to make sure that I understood correct, I think you talked about it last week or so. When you say like T4, T7, etc., you actually don't need all the do channel, but you mostly do Huato. Is that correct? I do. I tend to do more Huatos than the do uh, for a number of reasons. There's a lot more um, connective tissue or soft tissue on, in the Watteau area. And when I say Watteau, it doesn't have to be below the, it doesn't have to be the official Watteau. It just means on the side. And by the way, it doesn't have to be half its own. It can be its own. It can be anything. I'm tending to, to go for the Watteaus rather than the do. Occasionally, there'll be times when I will go for the do, especially if there's a vertebrae that's totally, there. the two are totally congested against each other. I'm like, I'm, I might, I would needle the water or if the verb is a totally stretched away from each other, mm. you know, and that you're touching and suddenly there's this soft gap in between and it's a large one. That's, a, that's, that's a um, situation where I would be interested in moxing in, in doing OQ. But generally speaking, I still, I'm not as big on the do channel. Uh, I, and I needle the waters generally, um, 45 degrees in and up as much. I used to do just 45 degrees in. I now do 45 degrees in and up because I want to push the spine upwards. So that's um, th that's a strand. Now, when I'm talking about points like do 15, do 16, or do 2, when, I, when I'm actually talking about the do, yes, I'm doing the do itself. And then for the other points, do you use bilateral hotel or kind of based on palpation or, you know, for liver, left side, etc. Right. So generally, so for example, in a, in a thyroid protocol, you know, which is, you know, which is something I used, use a lot on almost everyone that's due to T11, T12, um, T7, T5, uh, T5, that's a bilateral, you know, except the do two, which is in the center that everything's bilateral. And my, my T7 may be, uh, you know, in a little higher on one side and a little lower on the other side. That's totally acceptable. Um, then you having situations like, for example, in liver, tends to show, let's say you, they are also having liver. Um, you know, they showed liver on the front or whatever. And um, they may have something about around UB1718, or it may be on T17 to T9. So I release with left UB35 first, and then yes, I will needle the, whatever showed, and hopefully is better, on the right side. Uh, by the way, another um, thing that tends to show on liver is right UB43. Okay, it's not always right UB17 or 18. Um, it can often be UB43 instead of on the right side. So yeah, I, some of these are one-sided. Gallbladder, for example, is another one-sided. Um, T10 and T2 and small intestine 11 are all right side for gallbladder and stuff. But generally speaking, the Watteaus, I would tend to do bilaterally. Um, another example of something that would work one-sided is someone, say, has inguinal issues um, and you find something on L1. It's going to be on L1 most likely on the side of the inguinal issue. Somebody has a hip issue that's supposed to be an L3 then I'm, I'm going to look at um, L3 on, that, on the side of the hip, not the opposite side. Mm. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Would it be okay if I ask about the third patient with the cough? Yes, of course. Is it okay for me, Joe? Oh, yes. Yes, no problem. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I know it's kind of the cold flu season, but all of my cough patients are like not related to cold um so this third patient i seen her twice so far mm -hmm. she's a young mother two young child and very strong looking chinese uh, woman so during her second pregnancy she she had asthma bronchitis she had this horrible lung issues and since then which is i think her younger son is two years old she has periodically coughing episodes I mean, she describes since the, you know, the second pregnancy, she always has some sort of cough, but sometimes it gets so worse that, you know, she constantly coughs and it kind of drives me crazy. I have this two patient cough patient next to each other 
in the, in the rooms and they both cough and I'm like, you know, I feel like I hate to have these people. Um, yes, yeah, it's not related to food. And she does have immune reflex. You know, again, I did the immune protocol. Um, she has some liver and I did the jaji, maksa. I gave her herbs too and it's kind of hot, but not really. Um, yeah, it's kind, so of hot. it's kind of hot. The cough got a little bit better, but again, it doesn't stay very long. And you know, every time I mean, I've seen her twice, but okay. it was pretty bad. Like I could hear on the table this constant coughing. Yeah, I I confess that when a patient coughs on the table and it's it, it's if it's once and they go back to sleep, you don't care. But if you constantly hearing them, it it's it's it grates on your nerves. <laughs> Or at least it grates on mine. <laughs> so I, I sympathize. <laughs> it does feel like, oh my God, what am I supposed to do with this? It's like I, you, you, you feel like you need to run into the room yeah, and, exactly. and do something and stop that cough. And then you feel, what am I going to do? Put a pillow over them? <laughs> it's like, it's not, you know, you just, you know, you got to like, sometimes I have to relax around it. Yeah. But, you know, coughing, it, it's like, um, it's like a child screaming somewhere and you feel like you've got to go and save the child. Yeah. Or something. <laughs> but anyway, um, so back to this woman with her pregnancy. So a few questions that I would chase mm -hmm. are first of all, at what stage of the pregnancy did the cough start? And here's the reason why I'm asking. First of all, so the, and, and secondly, a little bit more of her medical history might be useful. Even though it started with a pregnancy, there may have been roots for this prior to the pregnancy. So something that started pregnancy suggests that it may have had something to do with a hormonal shift. Okay. Now, you may find that rather a hormonal shift, there may have been, a, a, say, a change in blood pressure. Or she may have been um, uh, had diabetes in, in, in pregnancy, or so. there may have been something in the pregnancy. Um, so I would so assuming that's a possibility, I would look at UB sixty six, um, which is a hormonal point. The name is Tongu. Tong means to, um, you know, Alice translates it as penetrate, but um, it means to communicate, and like an ambassador is a tongue something, you know. So. To who is the communicator in the body? The nervous system is one communicator, but the endocrine system is another communicator. Okay, so UB66 is, is an endocrine point. And inner yin or liver nine are, is, is, a, is another endocrine area, especially for women. Okay, so I would look at those as possibilities. And don't forget the inner yin or liver nine area um, releases the... Um, uh, the trapezius, which means it releases the upper back, which is related to coughing. So you've got kind of quote unquote many reasons. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm sort of layering it in a way that makes it a little more TCM like. Granted, um, it's kind of fun to do every so often. Um, but so I would look at the pregnancy now. But the other thing is, if it happens, say, at um, by the six months or later, it yeah. could have something to do with some weakness in the lower abdomen that starts pulling on the lungs, okay? Um, so there could be a structural thing that happened in pregnancy. And then of course, once you give birth, there's this huge weakness that happens in the lower abdomen because of all this pushing that happens. And then, you know, she may have never recovered. So, uh, you know, you, you said she's kind of a strong Chinese woman, but you know, I don't know what that suggests, you know, I don't know if that means chubby with um, chubby abdomen or does it mean you know it can be many things so the question is what is the state of the abdomen especially in a stomach 30 kidney 11 line mm -hmm. or a little bit above but lower abdomen is there like a, a lot of is there possibly a lot of weakness there or was it even a c-section yeah, it was c-section both times okay so Oh, okay. So, oh, so second child and first, first child was C-section, therefore second child was bound to be C-section because they were not going to take a chance kind of thing. Okay. So she had, a, so I'm just building a case that may be mm -hmm. rubbish, you know, but, but no, I mean, this is how we work on it. We, we just, you know, so there's, there's a case to be made for a weak lower abdomen creating the cough because she, the weakness started possibly with the first C-section then she's pregnant and she's like pushing this weakness 
there was never a full recovery from the first C-section for whatever reason, maybe something happened even before. And then she starts coughing. There's this weakness, she starts coughing. And then on top of it, another, by the way, another C-section, let's really <laughs> get you kind of thing. So there's a possibility that what you really need to do is, is strengthen the lower abdomen um, so what I would go for is the side gallbladder 27 mushu to strengthen that. Possibly if she's dropping, I mean, this is a particular situation for people who are either, they have very large abdomens, a very large breast, or they have an incredible or very strong lordotic curve. So the abdomen, lower abdomen pushes into the inguinal groove. That's your stomach 13 indication. Mm. Okay. So those are, that's a, a possibility that there is something there, but you know, it, so it could be a structural thing from the uh, pregnancy or it could be a hormonal uh, shift in the pregnancy that created this. And the other thing is on the back, I would look at adding uh, bladder 52 needle towards the spine as a way of uh, quote unquote strengthening the kidneys, um, meaning strengthening the um, the, the, the kidney's ability to grasp the chi because the cough can be related also to that. So those are the kinds of um, things that I would look at. Um, sometimes when a patient's coughing on the table, I would put a, a red diode ring on REN22. Especially if when you press on REN22, it makes them feel like wanting to cough yeah. or you know something like that. Um, so now the other option is, um, sometimes releasing the scalings or releasing the SCM is going to help the cough. Mm -hmm. So, and again, it's hard to know, I mean, you know, maybe with a little bit of medical history, maybe there's a way to figure this out a little bit better without seeing the body. Um, because what, what happens in pregnancy, the whole, the whole weight of the body shifts, and then the, the neck can kind of come to come to the rescue sort of thing, mm -hmm. you know, trying to lift the person up. So yeah, and she does have chronic neck and shoulder tension, yeah. but she didn't have like necessary reflexes on SCM or scalenes when I palpated them. So where uh, so where does she have um, tension or pain in the neck and shoulders. She describes like the whole neck and then, you know, the trapezius muscle. But when I palpate, she doesn't necessarily like have reflexes. Okay. So let me, let me just be clear that I understood. Mm -hmm. So when you palpate, you don't find reflexes, meaning you don't find anything or you don't find anything that you consider to be a reflex. In other words, oh, I, like, do you see what you're saying? I, I found this point, but this point is not in the book. Therefore, I'm not, I don't know what to do with it. I'm throwing it away. I'm not saying you did that, but you know, that, that's, that would not be a good thing to do because it doesn't matter what you name it. Just because I can't name it doesn't, it's still a ref, it's still always a reflex. I see. Aiming at. So, you know, because our knowledge include, you know, the best of us have limited knowledge. You know, I'm always going to, at some point, you know, let's say you have a pressure pain here at the top of the Adam's apple. Okay. You know, I don't have a reflex for it. It doesn't mean anything to me right now. But if I, if I had some patients that had it, one day I'm going to come up with a theory of what that means. So I'm still, and I'm still trying to release it. Even if I don't know what it is, I'm still, so it, it's not giving me a clue as to which point to use. It, does, it doesn't lead me to a protocol necessarily. But when I am led to a protocol through other abdominal findings or through a medical history, I'm going to use that weird reflex that I don't know what it means mm. to ascertain that my strategy is actually correct or mm -hmm. useful, maybe not correct, but useful. So, um, but anyway, so it, but it sounds like when you're palpating her neck and shoulder, she doesn't say, ouch. Yeah, that's okay. mm -hmm. when she moves her neck side to side or up and down. Can she produce pain? Would be the other. So, so it's much better if I can touch mm -hmm. and they respond. But if I can't, it's extremely annoying. But you have to keep asking them to move and produce it. I see. Okay. It's really annoying um, because when you touch, it's very it's immediate and it's fast. When they move fast, well, they don't always move the same, and it, it's annoying for them. It's annoying for you, but that's. That's the way to check mm. it, basically. So I would say, see what you can do to treat the neck. 
I see. Okay. Given the limitations of the case. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, at the, at the end of the day, you just kind of go, you know, screw this. Here's the theory. This is supposed to be good for your neck. San Zhao is supposed to be good for your oh. neck, damn it. <laughs> you know, it's like that's, or you say spleen three is supposed to release the scalenes. If I release mm -hmm. the scalenes, the rest is released. But, and also remember, inner yin releases the trapezius. There's a good mm -hmm. chance that will work. So you do, sometimes you don't have a choice. You can't be as precise and clear about what you do. You know, is anybody as precise and clear about what they do when they do the, the four gates? I doubt it. You know, I mean, they're very clear in their mind. Oh, four gates, great, uh, circulates the chi everywhere, blah, blah, blah. Stomach 36 tonifies the chi, but it's not, you know, it's not really directing it in the way that we think in the same, you know, in the way that you're saying kidney six is supposed to release below kidney 16, blah, blah, you know. We have a very strong affinity for this must release this, it must do this, it must do. Sometimes you just got to like, let it go and say, let's pretend she had kidney below kidney 16 because I think she's adrenal. Now, of course, there's a danger in that because there's a lot of judgment. You know, oh, I think you're an adrenal type. I mean, how many people have heard that going to a whole bunch of, you know, holistic practitioners? And it's kind of like it's a fashion statement in a way. But that fashion statement may work for this person. It's still okay. worth trying. So sometimes you can try it and test it, and sometimes you can't. Ideally, you test. But people don't come as ideals. Mm -hmm. They come with whatever. I mean, the people who are, have incredibly difficult conditions, and they have, they have no reflexes. You touch the abdomen, you don't, they don't feel anything. You don't feel anything. You know, um, I can't speak about pulse enough um, because I don't know enough, but the pulse doesn't create anything spectacular in your mind. It happens. You know, I'm willing to guarantee that even the great John Shen took pulses that he did not know how to interpret. Mm. You know, it's like I, I feel the pulse and there's nothing that, that I can't say anything about it. There'll be abdomens you can't say anything about, necks that you can't say anything about. It's okay. So use... She says she has neck pain. What's my best point for neck pain? <laughs> and pull it out and do it, <laughs> you know? And when they say, no, that didn't work, you go, okay, what's my second best? Okay, let's try that. If they can move the neck and give you some feedback, great. And if they can't, next week they'll give you feedback. What, you know, there's only so much. You know, I have to keep challenging myself to do the best I can. But at some point, I also have to challenge myself to say, I'm not going to do anything if I push, if I, if I have to have 100% clarity and I don't have it. So what do I do? Do nothing. I have to do something. So, you know, it doesn't sound, first of all, it doesn't sound like you have nothing on this patient because, you know, you have some options like UB66 and inner yin, et cetera. Um, or stomach 13 or, or mushu or whatever, but you also have the option of trying to just treat the neck mm -hmm. in whatever manner and, and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. some coughs actually do come from here, from, from the throat. Even though it can feel like it's coming from the lungs, it, it, it can be really the, the throat muscles that are kind of pushing. Um, it, it doesn't always come as low as the diaphragm. Mm -hmm. or a spasm in the lung itself. So it mm -hmm. could be, you know, it's just worth, worth playing with more, more possibilities. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Um, I think I have um, somebody that um, appears very uncomfortable when they're lying on the couch. Um, and I would kind of suspect something in the throat you know, they, they seem like they're kind of swallowing and not comfortable lying down, basically. But when I ask, they say, there's no problem. <laughs> but I just feel that there's something un, uncomfortable in, in the throat. So would you kind of approach it maybe the same way? Or she does have like a reflex of the F SCM generally. Then I would release that. And maybe even before that, I would go for the ear for ear endocrine and needle that to see if that releases it. I mean, so 
I'm not sure exactly as to what it appears also you're saying that it almost it's almost like the front of the neck bulges when they lie down is that what you're saying no she, she just kind of seems uncomfortable really uh, uncomfortable lying why do you think okay so what how do you how did you get that into the neck as opposed to anything she, else she kind of um like swallows and nearly lifts a little bit and also when i turn her uh, face down uh -huh. she likes to have a, a pillow underneath the chest i was just suspecting you know that she has something oh, that just it, lying down triggers um, right so there it, could be a few th i mean it can be the i don't know i mean the thing is she's not cooperating <laughs> so she's saying oh but everything's fine you're saying but you look really uncomfortable and she goes oh no i look just fine <laughs> so you know the uh, let let's say i mean you know, it's hard to know. But I mean, you know, it, it's it's something that you, one has to kind of reach up. There's a place where at some point I, I give up. You know, hey, if you think you're comfortable, that's fine. But you're the one who's going to be here for 20 minutes, not me. <laughs> sort of thing. I mean, there has to be some sort of it. At some point, I, you know, so sometimes I will, you know, maybe she wants an extra pill. But the thing is, the pulling of the neck forward may come from the upper thoracics. In other words, she's trying to lengthen... It may not be the throat, it may be the back of the neck or the, you know, T5 to T1 area that she's trying to, to release pressure, say, in the rhomboids or something like that, um, or the uh, levator scapula. It's hard to know. So here is an option, or it can even, it's not very likely that, because what's common for people lying down is the low back which is why I always give them a, a pretty large bolster. I don't have people lie down with, with, with the legs flat. Um, so what you could do is just palpate these areas and see if she, she reacts when she's lying face up. And then use those, you know, those as if they were reflexes and try and release them because maybe that will release the rest of, of what her other complaints are. Or, or what her actual complaints are, because she's not complaining of the of bringing the chin forward. But this bringing of the chin forward um, is basically stretching the upper back, mm -hmm. and she, that may be where the, ten, the the tension is, and it may not be. It may it may have nothing to do with with the throat, and it may be that when you're asking her, "Are you is your neck comfortable?" Um, the question doesn't register because it's it may not be the neck. Now it might be, but um, it might not be at all. So it, it, it's, it's might be, you might need to investigate a little more and or again, at some point, just let go. You know, it's like if they're, if they're, if I can't get the information as much as I would like to use it, it isn't being made available for me. So <laughs> what am I going to do? I mean, I can kill myself trying to, you know, to, to figure out something that can't be figured out right this second. Let go and move on. And uh, you never know. At some point, they might tell you, they might start describing to you something. You go, oh, that's why you do this weird thing. But, you know, uh, you know, the other thing is to just offer and see, do you want another pillow? Do you want a, another pillow under your knees? Would you like your, you know, sometimes you can put a pillow under their pelvis. So the lower back is curved a little bit. Uh, I have one patient when they uh, go face down, uh, I have to pad something under the shoulders because otherwise they roll forward. You know, when the head is in the headrest and you know, the shoulders are kind of rolling. Ab he absolutely insists, you know, if, if I haven't turned over and I forget, <laughs> it's like, where, where are my pads? <laughs> where are my shoulder pads? So you, you know, if you offer, one might discover a few more things around it. I don't know. So that's the, the point under the tendon? The oh, um, well, that's for neck in general and thyroid, but ear endocrine to release the SCM is um, sort of in the lung area. It's kind of, if you go to the lung area in the ear and you go all the way down, it, it's so it's, um, I don't know if you can see. Yeah. But let's see. Does that show anything useful? It's just your hand. If you could, uh, oh. your hand is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, look up, look up an ear map, and look up. There'll be an ear endocrine in the sort of lung area. You know, it, it's that big fossa at the bottom. Okay. Um, 
and at the very bottom of it, um, you'll get it. But yes, the point behind the ear is also uh, releases the neck in general. Okay. So and you, you, you needle, needle it rather than... I would needle it, uh, quite honestly. I mean, the original idea was, you, you know, okay. So this thing about releasing the SEM with ear endocrine originally came up with patients who are very sensitive to needles. If you can make them a little more relaxed, you know, so, you know, before you do needles, you take a tiger warmer and you do the ear endocrine, release the SCM, they're more relaxed, they may be more susceptible to, to taking needles. Um, you know, I'm a little bit in the theory, if somebody comes to acupuncture and they can take needles, it, it, they're making it extraordinarily hard. I mean, they know themselves, so they know they're going to, you know, so yes, I don't want them to sit the whole time like this, uh, waiting for the needle, but, you know, so if you, if you needle the ear with um, one of those green needles, the serine greens, you know, the uh, 0.12, yeah. chances are you'll be okay. I wouldn't use a 0.12 needle under the third toe is my first point on someone, okay, because just the fear off the toe is enough to freak some of these types of people out. But in the ear, you know, if you use a number one, they, they will feel it. But if you use a 0.12, or uh, I think there is zero zeros, whatever it is, the, the greens, or they even have blue, which is even thinner. Generally speaking, they're going to be okay with it. So I don't think you need to use the tiger warmer because it's, it's a good five minutes. Of sitting there with a tiger warm, right? It's it's it, in my opinion, it's not. Uh, it's a bit of a waste of time. Okay. And where do you locate uh, a uh, liver one? You know, for a liver excess patient. Oh, oh, hold on. You, liver, for liver deficiency. Or, liver one. Okay, so like, liver one is a liver deficiency oh, sorry, kind liver. of point, uh, whereas liver excess tends to be kidney yeah. seven, spleen seven. Um, heart three, pericardium um, uh, four. Um, so you have a number of options. You have actually quite a few options. Um, so you can take it. So the official Jingwell point of the liver is actually not where most Jingwell points are. It's a little lower towards the crease. So say between halfway between where the nail would have been the line of where the nail starts, the root of the nail and the crease. So you have a few options. You can take it like a regular Jingwell point. You can take it where the text says it is, which is so-called halfway, or you can take it on the crease. And then you can also take it in the middle of the, of the big toe and go to the edge, to, to where the um, uh, root of the um, uh, nail is, and just go a little, I mean, you don't want to needle the nail or marks of the nail. So just go a little bit past it, or you can go halfway between the middle of the root of the nail and the crease. So the liver channel can be either on the inside of the toe, of the big toe, or it can be in the center of the big toe. And then you have one more liver one, which is for eyes, specifically for eyes, especially red eyes, which is like pericardium one, but on the big toe meaning it's at the tip, literally at the tip. That's definitely a moxa point. Um, I think to needle that would freak people out um, way more than under the third toe. So you have quite a few, you have uh, between four to six options for liver one. You know, you, you just keep looking for it. I find for me, I find that the um, either the, the regular Jing, the, the official Jingwell point, meaning halfway between the root of the bed, the, the, um, the nail bed, and the crease on the, on the inside, or pretend it's a regular Jingwell point. Either one of those two tends for most people to do the best job for me. And the people claim, no, it's the ones in the middle that do a better job. So you're going to have to find which one you resonate with most and check. And the only reason I say it is because that's one you check first, but then you just keep checking. Um, the only thing I would say about liver one, two things I would say about it. Number one, it is a point that's be definitely better for rapid pulse. It's not a point for slow pulse. Okay? And two, it's, it is a point uh, that likes moxa. Mm -hmm. 
So yes, you can needle, absolutely. But it is um, adding moxa is, this is one of the points where if, if I'm needling it, I'm going, okay, you know, do moxa also. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? <clears throat> can I ask just one quick question, Abby, to clarify? Yes. Did you say um, for the weak lower abdomen, the GB 37? 27. Oh, I see. Mushu. Okay. So okay. go level with Got one it. four, go to the side. Okay, I thought you said 37. I'm like, I don't 27, know. 27. Okay, thank you. That's and, a... Gallbladder 27 is called um, Wushu, the five mm -hmm. um, axes. Mm -hmm. So, um, where stomach 25 um, is also has uh, is Tianshu. So they have the same character. Mm -hmm. um, so it relates to, to, the, to, to the strength of the abdomen as well, because the abdomen is an axis. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like a door. Um, but you know, it, it's the inguinal. So if you put gallbladder 27 on the inguinal, it makes sense. It's a support system, but if you put it on the side, it support, it supports it from the side mm -hmm. to, to lift it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Make Thank sense? you. Mm -hmm. right. right. Anything else? Um, just, um, yes. Leg ulcers, Abby, would you have any? Leg thoughts? ulcers? Yeah, just a lady has um, ulceration the leg that are really slow to heal for her. Okay, there's a, a few options. Um, so depending on the kind of ulcer. So for, okay, so um, first you, so you have the people who are, you know, things that are slow to heal might be because of bad circulation and or diabetes. So I would tr I would look at treating spleen three, uh, or and or doing full diabetes treatment, if, if that's applicable. Which means spleen three plus adrenal plus immune plus OD stomach twenty two on the right. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing is if you think it's related to skin only, um, your combination would be either uh, kidney nine and large intestine fifteen and or liver five large intestine 15 liver five would be moxa in this case um and but you can do both kidney nine and liver five in my opinion the other option is uh, ulcers um the the point for boils okay which are also an ulcer could be a boil that doesn't have to be would be ub63 uh jin men uh gate to metal okay that's a point that's uh, used both for boils and for um, it's it's a support it's a spleen supporting point. It supports the spleen functions and it's uh, also for uh, explosive diarrhea, watery diarrhea. Okay, so uh, basically it's a releasing toxin point in a in a sense. Okay, um, the other option is if they're actually bleeding, spleen seven is an option. If the ulcer is actually you know spleen seven could be an option. And if they're not bleeding spleen eight, about two fingers below spleen nine, not regular spleen eight, um, you can say, you know how there are herbs that quote unquote, we say generate flesh. Spleen, that spleen eight, which in the tongue um, uh, um, system, that's they call it kidney gate. That is uh, considered a point that generates flesh. The name of it is um, uh, DG, the earth machine. So it, it produces the earth, produces the, the flesh, so to speak. Um, so those are the, the main things that I would consider um, with ulcers. Um, and then, and the, yeah, definitely check circulation. So it could be something like under the third toe. It could, well, if it's on the leg, there's a good chance you, she has ulcers on her stomach line, on the stomach chi line. So stomach chi may not be available to you. But if it is, that might be something that to consider. Um, so I would look at those things. Okay, thank you. Yeah? yeah thank you. All right. Anything else? All right. Well, have a wonderful week. Thank you. Thank Enjoy you. Thanksgiving if you celebrate <laughs> or not. And I'll be here next Monday. Thank you, Ali. Thank you. Bye, Major. Thank you. Bye. Bye.